For my first project as a data scientist, I had to sit in on a technical demo where a team of developers showed us how they built a neural network that can identify specific movements like walking and running, shooting and digging, waving and crouching. And I took out my notes. I was so excited to understand how they collected their data, what models they chose, what, how long it took them to build the models. And as I was looking around the room, I started noticing some red flags. Like how there wasn't a woman or person of color in the design and development process of this neural network. And how this entire room was, of, was consisted of white and Asian men, except for me. And so when it came time for Q&A, I could feel myself start to sweat. And instead of asking the questions I want to geek out about, instead I knew I had to call out the elephant in the room. And I asked, can this neural network identify children? Can this neural network identify women? Can this neural network identify people of color? And then came the awkward silence. And I was like, oh god, <laughs> why did I ask this question? Why have to call the elephant in the room? Why is it always me calling out the elephant in the room? And as I was having this anxiety-driven internal dialogue, the men at the table were like, are you going to answer the question? Are you going to answer the question? I'm not going to answer the question. I don't want to get in trouble. Because the answer was no. And here's the scary part. This neural network could be used for self-driving cars, but couldn't identify a child or woman on the road. And this neural network could identify an active school shooter, but couldn't distinguish a child from a woman or person of color. And this is dangerous. And I was, I was think, as I was sitting there, I was like, how did I get here? And I took myself back to how I was often the only woman of color in my computer science courses and how that theme has persisted in my professional life. How I was the only one of color in that room, and it was tiring. And I was like, where are my ladies at? Why aren't there more women? And then I was like, oh, this is it. This is what all the articles are talking about, how we need more women in STEM, because it's dangerous and they're not. How can we construct systems that allow us to practice our values that nourish us, and not just accept what's been handed to us? How do we change the tech culture? But in order to really geek out and understand the mechanics of that neural network, it helps to have a background in computer science. Shockingly enough, according to Girls Who Code, less than 25% of women will be represented in the computer science field by 2027. This deeply terrifies me as a person who's developing artificial intelligence because so much of our lives are dictated and much to our chagrin governed by the technology and products that computer scientists create. How can we use automation to construct systems to practice our values? What are your values? Are you able to practice them? Are you nourished by our systems? How can we use automation and artificial intelligence to be more human? When people talk about automation, they mean technology that does tasks or reduces human labor. And in the past, automation has meant machines increasing efficiency in the agricultural, industrial, and internet revolutions. New age automation, however, isn't just increasing efficiency and reducing human labor, it's replacing cognitive labor. And we're making amazing progress in artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. But how do we make sure that we construct systems that don't harm us. And artificial intelligence will be in every aspect of our jobs. Doctors, lawyers, middle managers, and basically any aspect of a job where there is repetition and pattern recognition, AI does it better than us. And this should excite us. Like, oh my gosh, we finally are liberated to do, to have meaningful jobs and meaningful lives to allocate menial tasks to bots. I mean, mind-numbing duties to artificial intelligence and allow us to have time to actually do our jobs that we were hired for or to practice our creativity, which is the first value I think we should all practice in the new age of automation. Time and time again, it has been our creativity that saves our humanity. Automation is happening as we speak. Jobs that require more creativity are the least likely to be automated. 
Therefore, promoting a creative economy is a way to prevent replacement by autom automation and artificial intelligence. And it's not just a task where artists can be creative, it's where everyone can be creative. Given your workflow, how can you make it better? Or given a current architecture, how can you tinker it to be better? Because if you have crap and you automate it, you're just going to get more efficient crap. And we don't want that. Instead of viewing AI as our replacement, we can construct systems where AI and automation liberates us. But this may mean that jobs of the future may have higher or different educational requirements or different skill sets. One of the major findings done by a report in the McKin uh, by the McKinsey Global Institute is that between 75 million and 375 million people around the world will need to change occupational categories and acquire new skills by the year 2030. That's in a decade from now. So we should not be asking, will I be replaced by automation? No, the question we should be asking is, given my current skill set, am I qualified for a job of the future? Even my job as a data scientist will be automated, and it's a little perverse because it's the data scientists who are automating their own jobs. From the gathering data and the collecting and processing, it's complex but predictable. What will set us apart is the way in which we bridge knowledge gaps and be creative in the way we tell stories that lie in the data. Specifically in the US, 1.4 million jobs are at risk by new technology and other factors by the year 2026. And this may not mean much, so let me break it down. 57% of that 1.4 million jobs are done by women. And roughly two thirds of that 57% of that 1.4 million jobs are done by women of color. That means that roughly 500,000 jobs are at risk done by women of color within the next five to six years. What do we do? It is important to inspire women to excel in technology, technology used at large. Because when technology is built by more diverse people who are treated equitably, then it should work for a larger pool of people. Which brings me to our second value, equity. Notice how I did not say diversity, because I am uninterested in an organization that is proud of their diversity. Like, what does that mean? You're proud you hired three new black people? It's empty. I'm more interested in, in an organization that is proud of their equity, where the thoughts and contributions and values of those in, in the development and design process are treated equitably. Where two people in similar jobs doing similar tasks are paid equitably. Because if you're not getting paid equitably, you are less incentivized to give your voice. Once upon a time, there was a tech team that did not have a woman or person of color in the design and development process. And this technology that they built was, could identify facial recognition, was facial recognition. And um, they sold it to the government, and the government then used it in our immigration system. Now this technology is really great at recognizing white and Asian facial features, but really bad at recognizing brown and black facial features. So that means this very technology harms the exact people who are not in the conversation. So we need to change this fix it culture in the tech industry where you have a problem, boom, solution. Problem, boom, solution. Without even taking a step back and thinking, does the solution get to the root of the problem? Does the solution even address this problem? Does this solution cause five more problems? Women bring perspective and patience into the tech industry. Uh, there's a podcast by Mozilla's IRL. The episode is called, What If Women Built the Internet? And every time I think about that, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> what if women built the internet? What would that look like? This episode um, was brilliant in explaining how technology and systems are built in the image of their creator and how women tend to value consent more and would therefore develop technology that asks for consent more often. Privacy is one of the largest issues we are facing as a society. I am convinced that if a woman were in the development and design process of building the internet, 
We wouldn't be having these horror stories of how our data was hacked and how our minds are being unconsciously hacked and exploited and how we are at the mercy of our big tech overlords. But in order to get women into these tech spaces, not only do we need to change the culture, but women need to see themselves beyond antiquated narratives and master the uh, skills of bringing ideas into real life by developing and designing technology. It is essentially a new form of liberation. Which brings me to our third value, liberation. With artificial intelligence and automation, we actually have the opportunity to practice our liberation, whether this means giving uh, uh, employees ownership over their labor and resources, I don't know. But at the intersection of liberation and rights is ownership. Rethinking top-down ownership to community ownership is the fourth value I think we should all practice in the new age of automation. Community ownership or, or cooperative ownership is where employees are the owners. There is a co-op, cooperative owned, cooperatively owned grocery store in New York, and the membership is the is, has a wait list that is months long, and it's almost coveted because once you get access or membership to this grocery store, you get access to quality goods and services. I mean, cheeses I've never even heard of before, and. The, the way it works is you put in a shift, whether you're bagging groceries or you're uh, working the cashier. Uh, and in return, you get a chance at equity. You have a stake in the game. And this promotes community vibrancy. Cooperatively owned businesses are human-centric instead of profit-centric, where the purpose of the business is to provide excellent goods and services, better terms and conditions for the employees and is fair to suppliers and respects the environment. Cooperative ownership can even mean a chance at home ownership, where people get together and they form an LLC and purchase a home. And when you're ready to move on, so you want to start a family or go travel the world, you sell your share. This is a chance to start generational wealth for, for people and families who don't have that opportunity right now. Cooperative ownership even means a way to combat gentrification. Cooperative ownership also means a chance for small businesses to thrive. They get together and they form bundles of goods and services that actually satisfy the needs and wants of consumers and allow them to be competitive against these monolith corporations that don't care about consumers and are profit driven. Cooperative ownership also means supplement or an alternative to UBI, which is universal basic income, because let's be honest. Automation will displace some jobs. There will be people who will be put about out of work. And we, we will have a shift in the new age of automation from one to three careers in a lifetime to five to 10 careers in a lifetime. That's asking a lot of someone. There requires a certain level of resiliency, <coughs> resiliency of the mind and of income and of time in order to be successful in the new age of automation. I like to say that the backbone to resiliency is resourcefulness, which is the fifth value I think we should all practice. Resiliency and resourcefulness, I combine them. <coughs> Understand who you are, what you stand for, what you want, what can you do with what you have. Those are key to being successful at resiliency. In conclusion, we need to cooperate with AI. We need to rethink business models and allow us ourselves to practice our creativity and liberation. My call to action is to invest in and provide resources for young women of color to step into their power, to learn to code, to learn to ask questions and seek solutions. That is the essence of science. Because if women of color are going to be disproportionately affected by automation, then it should be the women of color who learn to automate. We can construct systems with women who color because I believe that we embody the five values I think we should all practice to have, to have nourishing systems. Creativity, liberation, equity, cooperative ownership, resiliency. And it's not just to feel good. And it's not just to be proud of our diversity. It's an effort to save our humanity in the new age of automation. Thank you.